but there was this, this boy that was like, he was applying for colleges. He was not a good student and he like didn't apply for the colleges. His dad was like, did you apply? And he was like, nope, didn't apply. And he was like, why? Like, why not? And he was like, cause I'm not going to get in anywhere. And his dad was like, well, you didn't even apply. Like you won't know. So he was like, okay. So he like wrote a letter and he sent in that, um, sent in the application and he was like, Ooh, like suddenly he felt that he was like, Ooh, like, what if I get in? Like he had that hope. And then he got the letter back where like, with the, like from the school and he was like holding the letter and he was like, Oh my God, it's like, maybe like, maybe I did make it in. And then he opens the letter and like, of course he didn't get in. Like he didn't even apply in time, but it, that moment of hope that he had, that's something that like from that story is like, even if the chance is 1%, you're 99% likely not to, but 1% likely, there's still a shot. Like, why wouldn't you take that shot? Like, if you don't take it, it's 100% guaranteed you won't. So I love holding on to that 1%. Like, even if it's unlikely, like, hold on to it, because just maybe. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Invictus Mindset Podcast. Today's guest absolutely needs no introduction. She is the 2015 2016 Fittest Woman on Earth and the author of Daughter and her most recent book, What is the Way? One of the most decorated athletes in CrossFit history, Katrin, David's daughter. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And we've been meaning to get this done for so long. So I'm really excited to be sitting here and finally having this conversation with you. Likewise, you, you've got such an incredible story. My good friends, Heber and Mars have crossed paths with you a ton and you've done so much with the buttery bros that I'm excited to officially get connected with you after seeing so many cool experiences and adventures that you've had with those guys. Yeah, that's something that I honestly multiple times thank them for um, honestly giving me a platform to be able to share my story and throughout the years. I want to say I got to meet them in probably 2014, 15, and I've just gotten to be incredible friends with them as such, which is just like the foundation of being able to create anything great is having that safe space is knowing that I trust them. I adore them. I love spending time with them. So they've always been able to, what I feel like is get the best out of me. Um, Mm -hmm. So always thank them for that. And for those times that we've gotten together and documenting things that I have for the rest of my life. You get to see those, these times in a, in an athlete life is, it's very precious. I don't get to live those, you know, 2015 is, I lived it and it's gone, but I have it documented in 2016 and, and it ebbs and flows and you're in kind of like a, a different state or a different mindset or a different kind of just span in your life. And to get to have that and look back and see where you were and, and where you've evolved or, whatever that is, it's, it's really precious. And absolutely for me. So it's also super cool. The timing of it all, because you look at like the evolution of, of social media, technology, YouTube, the, the cognitive innovation of creators like those guys to be willing to travel the world and yeah. not only travel, but they're still pretty fit. They jump in with you guys. And you know, yeah. I love their slogan scale for life, <laughs> but Man, like huge shout out to those guys for for being able to document so much and not only document, but it's incredibly entertaining too. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, um, so the Buttery Bros weren't created until 20, I want to say 2018, 2019. So before Mm -hmm. that, they were Huber and Marston and then the Buttery Bros. And that's their online personas. And that's what they have created, um, which is just, there's, always fun around them it's never a dull time and you saying like what incredible shape they're in like that's also part of the entertainment that they would actually hop into games training camp which is kudos to them that's a very closed off period of time for me that's when i shut everything down there's there's not media there's not this or that but they've always been able to enhance my training so they've been able to come in, they do my training and I'm able to have fun, but they also are so respectful and they know exactly the goals, the process, 
um, what we need as athletes to perform at the game. So they're always able to enhance that and help and not be a distraction. So it's a, it's an, a very impressive skill that they've developed there. Yeah, absolutely. You know this all too well that most of us are the average of the people that we spend the most time with. And especially in the professional athlete spectrum, those people within that, that circle of trust, they simply need to get it. They need to understand that you know, you're not being standoffish when you're focused. You need to dial in sleep, food, recovery. You know, Training is, is going to be emotional at times. There's going to be anger, frustration, tears. And it, it's cool that you, know, you can integrate someone like that from a media source that is so real, authentic, but then simultaneously you know, finds a way to, to capture such special yeah. moments. And, you know, I can't help before we get too deep into your story that, you know, you've always been the star of the show, but now you're, you're switching to the other side a little bit, creating a little bit of media as you and one of your best friends, Annie Thoris daughter launched your podcast, the daughter podcast. I just finished watching it a little bit ago around, you know, the last two years. What was the creation of that like and how did that ideation come come to the surface based on conversations you guys had and then how was your first show? So this is something that we've talked about for years. For many, many years, we've wanted to have a po- we've wanted to have a platform to share more. That's what we initially wanted, and we've never really known what it is. So the deal with me and Annie is that we're both out there. You know, there's like the people that come up with the ideas and everything. This is a good idea. I wish you this, 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 this. And then training happens and life happens. And we're not the doers. We don't, we're not the ones that make it happen. Mm -hmm. Um, And his name is Keisley. He was in my college class. So I've known him since I was 18. He's come in and he's been helping us a lot with just getting shit done. So it's awesome that that we still get to be the creators and have the ideas. And then we get to focus on training and he makes sure that these things get done. So it's just come out of conversation. And Annie is, she's my soul sister. She's, it's incredible that we kind of like, she's four years older than me, but she lives one town over. We had the same gymnastics coach growing up except for like, because she was four years older, I never trained with her. Um, My best friend from gymnastics was doing pole vaulting when she did pole vaulting. So I kind of heard of her. We were kind of almost always crossing paths. We had a very similar like kind of like upbringing into CrossFit. And then I see her win the CrossFit game. So I was like, wow, like that, like that's what I want to do. And it was my mom and my grandma actually that were like, maybe you should try CrossFit. And then fast forward and she's my best friend and we're both two times fittest on earth. We both have the same goal of wanting to be the best in the world. And we just, it's so special to have somebody that can relate to you on that level, to both have the respect for one another, to have the love for one another, because we have the same goal. Like I, I think that can very easily create a tension or resentment or some kind of envy but I truly and this is I this is what I think is like the most special thing about our relationship is that we both want so much for one another Mm -hmm. we both want the absolute best so we can have these raw honest conversations we can be very honest with each other if it's something that we don't want to hear she can I can take any criticism feedback whatever you want to call it from her because I trust that it comes from a place that she wants to help me at all times and vice versa. I can always say what's on my mind. I can always be honest with her because I so truly love her and want for her. Um, That's so incredibly special. Very, very often, especially on the female side of things, like girls don't want to train together. And there's this, this unique animosity that's kind of unspoken, but you can almost feel the tension when you're around it. And it's very, very unique and almost sounds like a a very special spiritual frequency that you guys can coexist within the same operating systems of pursuing the same goal, but simultaneously where it's like, if you beat her in in a workout, 
yeah, she's bothered by it, but then simultaneously she's like, that that was my best, and she elevated me, and then vice versa. If she beats you, you're kind of like, all right, like I'm, I'm going to bring it even more next time, but simultaneously it's like you guys offset each other very well to elevate each other just that much more in both strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, and I think that's exactly it of like, yeah, we're pissed when the other one wins. It's like, dang, like, because we – I want to win. And we always, we laugh at this. Like, I want to win, but I want you right there next to me in second place. And then like vice versa. So we're able to say that we're able to laugh. And if she beats me in a workout, we are, like, if she can do it, so can I. And if she could go that fast, why can I not do it? And she just raises the standard for me. If this is what I can do and this is what she did, now I need to figure out a way to get up here. And if mm-hmm. I do something and she does this, like she needs to figure out how to get up here. And I feel like we can show one another what's possible. That's super cool. It's a beautiful lens to see where you guys are at now. But how did it start, right? Like you saw her win the games. You were incredibly motivated. You know, she's an Icelandic woman as well. How did you instill or kind of build and create that original trust at the onset? Um, that did not happen right away. Yeah, I'm sure. Like I was very like when I, st- I was doing the foundation course, she had just won the games is like August 20. 20- 11. Mm-hmm. Well, so long ago. It's good for me. It's crazy was, to say out loud, huh? Yeah. Um, and I, I just went to the gym that she was at. And that's the one that I wanted to go to. I sign up for the foundation course. And I still remember the day that like she came in and she was coaching this one class. And I just remember, oh my God, it's Annie Thor's daughter. Like so starstruck. Like that's her. She just come back from winning the CrossFit Games. Um, and I remember it was something, it was like a gymnast, I was a gymnast growing up and, um, I think we were doing some sort of like handstand hold up against a wall or handstand pushups or something that, um, I was able to do. And I remember being like, she was like, good job, Katrin. And I still remember the like, oh my gosh, she knows my name. And that has actually stuck with me as like, like I was two inches taller and it was so special to me. And that's something that I've learned and I try and take that away to actually remember people's names and mm-hmm. use their names because it is really special to people. Um, it makes them feel seen and noticed. And I remember how much that gave me. Um, so that was the start of that. And then I just, I progressed pretty fast. I remember a couple weeks in, um, and this was when the whiteboard was still always up there. Um, people came up and they wrote their scores up on the board and I just did the, the workout of the day and there was a team that had come from the game. So three of the girls on the team and they'd like written their scores up there and I beat all of them. And I remember getting this like, and that, so that was, this was only a couple weeks in. I remember calling my mom being like, I want to go to regionals. Like, I'm going to make regionals. She's like, okay. And very quickly, so this was probably, let's say, September. I remember at New Year, um, 2011, 12, um, I put on this bracelet. It was this yellow bra- uh, bracelet. And that was my reminder that I was going to go to the CrossFit Games. And I kept that bracelet on until at regionals, 2012, when I made the CrossFit Games. And that was my constant reminder of every day in training when I was doing run intervals, like the hand comes up and I saw the yellow bracelet. It was getting hard. I was like, I want to go to the games. I want to go to the games. Like that just pulled me and it pushed me. And I remember holding planks and I'm like, like the, the coaches would come and add sandbags to your bags and more and more. I just kept holding and holding and holding. I always saw that yellow bracelet. It was just my constant reminder every day that I was going to make the games. Um, and somewhere along the line, um, and Annie actually still to this day does this. And I love this so much about her is that when she does see somebody working hard and she sees potential, she brings them in. And I remember when she invited me to come and train with her and Frederick and BK. And I was like, oh my God, like I'm going to go train with Annie. And I was so nervous for it. I was really, <laughs> really nervous. And this was in the old, um, old CrossFit Reykjavik. So she actually had switched gym. So then we're in different gyms. Um, and yeah, it was, I remember being really nervous for it and like thinking it was really, really cool. And 
I didn't switch over to the same gym as her. I felt like I'd gotten to know the people at the gym that I was previously at. I was still so new to it. Like I was not doing open gym. I was only taking classes and some of the coaches were like helping me with extra programming. So remember like that's something that I remember making a decision to not go over to CrossFit Reykjavik then because I was so nervous that like, you know, what if she was traveling? What if she was elsewhere? Like I wouldn't have anybody else to like kind of hold me there. Mm -hmm. Um, So that actually did put a little bit of like a rift in our relationship because I feel like she was actually like reaching out like a lending hand and wanting to help me. and, And now looking at her still, when I'm not there, she has young girls come and train with her all of the all the time in CrossFit Reykjavik, and she kind of like brings them in. And Frederick is just like a coach at heart; he can't help himself. He always wants to help. Like he'll stop his workout to go help somebody else. He's That's like, cool. yeah, I've learned a lot from him. Um, it's cool to hear the foundation of your relationship was was so much about what can I give rather <laughs> than what what can I get. And I think what's what's incredible as well is to, you know, in, in retrospect, be able to see that when people are willing to put in the work, whether it's right or wrong, it's it's the the purposeful effort that I yeah. think carries the majority of the meaning. And when people observe that, they almost want to help more because they realize like, oh, you you actually really want this. You don't just like paint this beautiful picture with words, your actions follow your thought patterns and your words. I I want to be a part of that. That's cool. Yeah. And then I think the true like foundation of our relationship was really um, a couple years later. It was the 2014 um, summer of 2014 when I didn't make the games. And I came back to Iceland after like not having qualified and she had qualified and she was training for the games. And that was the summer that I was like, okay, I, I hopped into her training. I push her every day. And that was my, like, my whole mission was just to like, I hopped in with her. She wanted a training partner. I could push her. And I think that also like, cause I could push her without being her direct competition. So mm-hmm. I think that kind of like took down all barriers for both parts. I got to go train with one of the best of the world you know, that's where we truly started training together again. Um, and she got to be pushed again by not being threatened by me. She was able to let her walls down. And that's when, like, since then, honestly, we've just been two peas in a pod. And Would uh, you say, too, I, I've heard you speak a lot about confidence in the past and not just, like, confidence in, in the attractiveness of, of a woman, but also confidence in relation to performance. Trident Coffee is sponsoring this episode of the Invictus Mindset Podcast. My guys over at Trident taught me something really important this last year, that we are all a bundle of stories, both good and bad and everything in between. At Trident, they're storytellers. All of their cold brews remind their customers that that they are part of something bigger than themselves. They help create connections through symbology and storytelling that engage their customers on an emotional level, and this distinguishes them from other coffee brands. You can find Trident in Imperial Beach and in Coronado. They offer over 14 plus nitro cold brews along with dairy-free options. You can find the perfect brew and pair it with one of their treats from their keto bakery. All these options will allow you to support your health and fitness journey with Trident Coffee. They're more than just a coffee company. You can check them out over at tridentcoffee.com and use code INVICTUS20 for 20% off online and in tap rooms. Once again, that's tridentcoffee.com. Use code INVICTUS20 for 20% off online and in tap rooms. Take your coffee experience to the next level. Two important factors for us over at Invictus Mindset are true care and attention to detail. My friends over at RX Mark here have been bringing innovative fitness tools to the market since 2009. From their award-winning Evo speed ropes, to their amazing gymnastics grips, to their line of inflatable fitness equipment, they're constantly looking to problem solve 
within the fitness industry. They're always allowing us to have our gear work for us rather than against us. Hop on over to RX Mark Gear and use discount code Invictus Mindset to shop their latest cutting edge gear. Have your gear work with you and not against you. And it sounds to me like at that time, the summer after 2014, when you did not make it, that not only were you pushing her, but you could give everything with nothing to lose. Yeah. It was almost like, oh yeah, I can push her and I could beat her, but if I lose, it really doesn't matter. I'm not going to the games this year. So it's like, now you can just like, where is my edge? I'm going to seek that edge every second of every day to see what Catcher and David's daughter is fully capable of. And then at the very least, it's going to help Annie go win the games yeah. and also help me elevate and delegate myself to to the peak of my p- potential. Yeah, it's very true. I think there's something to that. Um, I don't know what the right word for it is, but I think like not making the games kind of just brings you down right back to the bottom, you mm-hmm. know, like, okay, we got a bill from here. Like I didn't make the games. I'm not even, not, am I not competing to be the best? I don't even get the opportunity to. So it yeah. kind of puts everything back down. And exactly as you said, you have nothing to lose. And there's something so powerful about not being restricted by anything like that. Totally. Like I think it would be so like, there's, Sometimes like this desperation that comes out of like things are out of your control when you want a certain outcome, when you want certain things and you're so focused on it, you can get so wrapped up in it that I think it creates this like restriction on you. Mm -hmm. And then I think once that had disappeared, it's kind of a dangerous place to be in. 100%. Nothing. I think it goes back to that Tony Robbins quote of when you exchange expectation for appreciation, your world changes forever. (laughs) I mean, seeing how you lit up when you said, I had the gift of being able to train with one of the best in the world. But had you made the games, maybe the cognizant piece would have been, oh, I have to train for the games Mm -hmm. versus I get to train for the games. And I think there is a very distinct difference between the two. And so it's very cool to to see that. But also, I think the, the concept of feelings is so important because... On one end of the mindset component, we have feelings, they come and go, right? We can't hold on to every single feeling, otherwise they're going to own us and we're just going to be an emotional roller coaster all the time. But then there's those, those unique special feelings of that feeling that I had when I didn't make the games in 2014, I never want to feel that again. That was a low moment that brought me to a place that I just do not want to visit again. And it sounds to me that that was just a catalyst to really make and shape this, this unique upward trajectory that you've kind of been on ever since. Yeah. I think that moment really did shape my future. And I think it creates exactly what you said, this thing of like, I don't want to feel that again. So when Mm -hmm. things get hard, when the workouts get hard, when you get the opportunity to dig deeper, you do because you never want to feel that again. And you want to make sure that you're going to be the one. Like I literally that year, every single workout that I did, I imagined somebody next to me. I was like, I took somebody from my region. Like I remember being at the track and I'm like, I'm finishing my, up my, like, finish up the 400. And I'm like, Kristen Holt is like, she's in front of you. She's in front of you. Go get it. If like, you want to make the games, go get her. Like, I'd always pick somebody who was like best at that, who's best at running, who's best mm-hmm. at that workout. I'm like, I put them right next to me. And I'm like, I want to be the one that makes the games. Like, I want to be, make sure that that does not happen again. And I think that kind of like dig, I think to be able to get to that place, I needed that pain. And I needed that failure and I needed that disappointment in myself for me to able to get to that place. And like that year I was a full-time coach. I started coaching CrossFit. I was a full-time law student. I was trying to like train and compete for the CrossFit games. And I didn't have that edge. I was kind of like, I was making the games. I was like, fine. I'm like, I'm a games athlete now, kind of like content and happy with that. And then don't make it. And then... I never want to not make it again if I try. And it helped me just make those decisions of like, law wasn't for me. I liked the idea of it. I didn't like the doing of it. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so I just decided to take that one semester off and it like helped me all of these things, just make these decisions that I otherwise wouldn't have. And that's also something that I think is so crazy is the difference between like, yeah, I was what I believed working hard, you know, you kind of like, I was following a program and like doing, you know, I was doing this and doing that. But the difference between like, I wasn't fully sleeping. I wasn't like focusing on my nutrition. I was like coaching and training and coaching again and then training again and just very like thin spread. And then once I decided, I was like, okay, I'm just going to take this semester off. And like, I know, I don't know what I want to do in school. I know I want to do CrossFit and going from like kind of being thin spread to like, right, this one semester, I literally, it was all I had. It was all I was doing. I, that's the first kind of like, months that I spent a lot of time in Boston, um, up at CrossFit New England. So I knew nobody there either. I had no friends. I had nobody to go out with. Like it was my, I went from like, okay, I'm working hard to like 100%. And the magic that happens in between when you give something, everything that you have. And I was really just, I loved what I was doing. That's all I want to be doing. I wanted to work hard. I spent all day at the gym. I was like in between sessions, I'd do recovery. I started reading sports psychology and with no expectation because I hadn't even made the games. I was just, I remember that's the year that I was like, I want to be the best me, be the best me. It was all I want to do. Like I'm going to be better than I was yesterday. And then do that one event at a time. And suddenly like Sunday morning at the, at the games, you're like, oh my God, I have an opportunity to win the CrossFit games, which I'd never even imagined before. Yeah. Wow. I I just love being able to like sit back and hear, you know, the psychology that that you went through in that pursuit. And, you know, it it wasn't necessarily adding more. It was it was letting go of certain things that were hindering your 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 speed and your momentum forward. Yeah. When you look back, was was 2014 like the first time you really battled adversity or could you remember a moment you know, in your childhood or, or a time prior to that where you were well equipped? Or was this the first time that you're like, man, I just got punched in the face with something that really hurt me. And now I have to figure out how to navigate this space. Um, it was probably the biggest one. Yeah. But I'd say yeah. like, so I was Literally, I just have this competitiveness in me that I've had since I was a kid. I just, I wanted to race everybody to the next lamppost. I, I always wanted to like, even on the playground, I would make these like, okay, let's run up the slide. Let's slide down the top over that swing. Let's run. And I wanted to race everybody. You know, it's just something that's ingrained in me. Um, And then doing gymnastics, I was not a good gymnast. So I love gymnastics. Or actually, I think I love the discipline of gymnastics. That's a better way. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that I was training from probably like 10, 11 years old. I was training six days a week, four hours a day. So I loved like how much time we spent in the gym. There was conditioning every day. And like once a week we had a conditioning day and that was my favorite. Like I was the one that was like, can we, can we do have the conditioning day? (laughs) I was like, no, like I loved that. Like and when we had conditioning tests, that's where I like, I wanted to win the conditioning test. Like that was what mattered to me. But when it came to the gymnastics itself, I wasn't winning gymnastics competitions. I landed on my head a thousand times before I was able to like, some of my friends were like cats. They just could like all, when they try to twist for the new time or they had the double tuck or whatever we were doing, they just landed on their feet. And then there's always me just, I don't know. I have no awareness where I am in space. So like <laughs> gymnastics wasn't for me. And I, I think that helped me a lot because I landed on my head and I just kept trying and I landed on my head and then I'd kind of get it and then I'd get it. So it kind of showed me, like, I think it did teach me grit. And I think it did teach me persistence because I did stay in gymnastics until 16. Um, it's a long like, time to really stick with it. Would you say, you know, in, in, my perspective, you know, Iceland is is producing some really high level CrossFit athletes. Is gymnastics a pretty common staple for kids at at a very young age to pursue something that that teaches skills, keeps them safe, gives them structure, you know, so many different tools, body awareness, strength, all of the above. 
Is that mm-hmm. something that's pretty common? Yeah. For girls, I'd say that's the most popular sport. Boys are put into soccer, handball, basketball. Um, girls are put into gymnastics um, and soccer, actually, also. So, Very like, cool. I think the, the girls coming out of gymnastics, like, we already have a stronger upper body, a stronger core. Mm-hmm. Um, we have body awareness in general. And then, like, I think there's a discipline to gymnastics that leads to just discipline and sport. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd say that, like, that kind of adversity was, like, in gymnastics, I would say has helped me. And then I think it was actually twofold. I was always a great student. And at the end of 2014, I failed my law class, which was my first time failing ever. Wow. And I think that was my, like, I think that's the universe. Like, this isn't for you. Like, um, cause I think if I would have passed the class, I would have kept on with law. Um, and have you heard like everybody wants to be whatever a rock star until it comes to doing what rock stars really need to do, like the practicing yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the vocals and this and that. And I think the idea of being a lawyer really like appealed to me. But when it came to actually like being a lawyer and doing what lawyers need to do and like all of the reading, I was like, that's not for me. So I think yeah, that totally. was the first way of like taking that away. And that helped me like, okay, like I don't know what I want to do. I just failed my first class ever. It helped me make the decision to like, all right, I know I want to do CrossFit. And that mixed with not having made the games and like, oh, that put me like, that was my first like real, like I really tried to do something and I didn't do it. I failed at it. It's so crazy to me how we're so conditioned as humans to stray away from failure. But in reality, if we actually pursue it, it can be some of the greatest lessons that you know, either teach us or, or show us what we don't want as well. Yeah. And it's, it's cool to hear that it was that moment that you ultimately made the decision to, instead of one foot in, one foot out in your competitive CrossFit journeys, you, you made that decision. Like, you know what? I'm, I'm going all in. This is what feels right. This is what I want. I've reflected on it and, you know, landed then at, at CrossFit New England how did you ultimately make the decision to pursue CrossFit New England versus somewhere else? And how did you ultimately meet Ben Bergeron? Um, I honestly can't remember like the, the initial meeting or how it came about. I have a, my gut feeling is that I got invited to the ECC. And honestly, I was a college student. I had no money, so couldn't even pay for my flights to get there. So I remember like not being able to go compete at the ECC. Um, and I think the response, what he said when I was like, I can't make it, like, I won't be able to compete, but like, thank you for the opportunity. I think he said something along the lines of like, okay, um, but you're always, no, you're always welcome to come train up here. Um, and so the offer kind of stood. And then I had gotten to know Rachel Martinez, who was on CFNE's team. Mm-hmm. And... I honestly can't remember how I ended up like training with her. It might've been something to do with grid. There was something that I was like in the States for, um, that I ended up doing like a training week with CFNE. Wow. I really liked it. It was like, they had two teams. It was such like, I think they had two full teams. They were really competitive. Um, every morning, like you showed up at nine. It was the first time that I had experienced coaching in CrossFit. Like there was a coach, and there's a team training and I got to be a part of that. And I like, like that we trained from like nine to noon. We took like a break and then we would train again in the afternoon. Um, so that um, fall, so after not making the games, I went back to see if any for a training camp. And that was when Michelle um, Latondra was there, Becca Voigt was there. Um, their whole team was there and I remember hopping into a training camp and because I would not competed at the games, you know how hard it is after a big adrenaline fall from the games, like it's hard to get back into it and it takes a couple months and I had not competed. I trained with Amy for the games and then not competed. So I wasn't in that adrenaline dump and I remember I was just crushing everybody and that was a huge like whole like confidence booster and a huge like, okay, I'm like doing something right now. <laughs> and it was probably like riding that emotion 
and kind of look like riding that wave that it was sometime I feel like it was like September, October that I actually remember. And all of the team, they're always like, Ben doesn't take on any more athletes. Ben doesn't take on any more athletes. Like he has those, he has those. And that's what everybody was telling me. And I remember just being like, you know what? I don't have a coach right now. Like if I get a no, I just still don't have a coach. So I remember walking in and I was like, will you be my coach? And he didn't say yes. He was like, I'll think about it. And I think we did like, he sent me some programming for the next couple months. And then at the end of the year, he was like, okay, I'll be your coach. That's and that- cool. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. Exactly. And that's kind of like, you, you always have to shoot your shot. That's kind of like, yeah, you don't have something. Well, if you don't get it, the answer is no, you just still don't have Wait, something. is that dating advice that you're giving? You, uh, you have to shoot yeah. your shot. You got, you got to <laughs> ask. And if not, you're back to square one. You didn't lose anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're person now. If you don't try, you still don't. Um, totally. I think it's general, um, general, just like life advice. Yeah, and totally. I think, I think it's cool to hear that because I don't know. I feel like it was at the time where you know, CrossFit training camps weren't super huge yet. No. I feel like there were there were great teams. You kind of had Brute was in the conversation. I think CrossFit New England was incredible. Invictus. And on the West Coast, you had Valley CrossFit that was still kind of in the mix. You had Invictus, and then you had NorCal with Jason Kalipa yeah. and Miranda Oldroyd. And um, it's just cool to see how it's evolved a little bit uh, over time. I actually, very similarly to you, trained alongside Becca Voigt as she was training for the games that same year when Ben was her okay. coach. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm sure we probably did some of the same the workouts. Were that we were doing. Yeah, it was super cool. And honestly, it was the first time too where, I don't know, I thought it was cool that there was like a customized approach. Like you look at Becca Voigt and, you know, she's a bigger woman, basketball background, mm-hmm. um, incredibly fit, really, really, really good at all cardiovascular machines. But, you know, obviously at that time, handstand push-ups, ring muscle-ups, the gymnastics elements were, were tough. Yeah. And it was cool to see how the relationship between her and Chris Clever, where Chris was like super gymnast and then Becca was like amazing at all the, the generalized athletic and cardiovascular things. And to see their yin to the yang and then the little new guy in the corner just hanging on by a thread. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it, it's cool to go down memory lane a little bit. And you were a part of Comp Train for a really long time. That was, you know, a really big part of, of your journey. And, you know, when you self-reflect on, on some of that time, were there any major highlights that stand out to you other than, you know, obviously becoming the fittest woman yeah. on earth? Um, It's honestly like, I think I probably spent like eight years there, you know, mm-hmm. like, I'm such a different person from when I first arrived there to the person when I left. And it's, it's such a cool thing to look back on and the relationships that I form, the challenges that I went through, the things that I overcame there. Um, and the Bergeron's all, they became my family. They, I was what, 20 years old and come into the States and they took me in and, um, you know, it's like my and Harley lover, still my little sisters and Jonah and Bodhi. I'm just like a part of the family. And, um, so that's something that I'm always able to look back on and like such just cool times. Um, and like, I, I don't know, like when I first came there, I feel like I was like more of like a kid, you know, mm-hmm. like, bright eyes and just like everything's exciting and I just really want to do this and um then you go through a lot of things and like I learned so many things and you're able to mature and you're able to learn and um if you fast forward to like 2020 I remember having a, I went through a back injury um I herniated a disc and I was like unable to train and I was trying to get ready for the 2020 games. And that was probably the biggest reflection of like, okay, there's such a difference of like, you have, I had a body when I was 20, 21, 22, 23, you just have a body that can just bounce back in three seconds. You can just dig yourself into the dirt. I, my like thing that I liked, it was my edge was that I wanted to train more than everybody else. And you can 
win some on that and lose some on that. Like sometimes that's, it's a fine balance, but mm -hmm. mentally that was my edge was that I always wanted to do more always. Like when we were done training, I'd be like, please can I have more? Like, please can I do more of this? Like, I just love training and I wanted to do more. And, but I didn't have experience. I didn't have a great mindset. Like I started working on my mindset, maybe like 2014, 15. Um, so very just like raw and immature when I got there. And then you fast forward to 2020 and I felt like all I had was experience and mindset because I, I wasn't really able to train or prepare like physically. So that's something that was like so black and white and, and clear at that time of like, I was, I had been able to build that mind, that fortitude, that trust in myself and that trust in my experience that can't be cheated. It took all of those years. It took all of those years to gain that knowledge and to gain those perspectives, which ultimately then ended up on the podium in 2020 without really, it was a really challenging year. Um, and it really helped me like COVID helped me out with pushing it further back because I'd been so injured. Um, so just taking all of those lessons and all of those experiences and really like feeling like I've grown more into like came in as a kid, you walk out as a old woman, um, mm -hmm. and that's that I've always been like, I'll be eternally thankful for. Um, I love the way you described that. It, it, it was such a, and it was beautiful in the way you described it, especially in the sense of inevitably we're, we're all going to get reps. We're all going to get older and we're all going to get overuse injuries and, and certain things that, you know, may, maybe it's a, a motor recruitment pattern. Maybe it's bad luck. Maybe it's a, an accident, but sometimes the physical is going to get taken away. And when that happens, I think the question becomes, how do you respond? And yeah. can you lean into the mindset component of control the controllable, which I, I've heard you speak on before, which is, okay, the physical is taken away. Can I lean into my go odd mobility? Can I, you know, enhance my breath work? Can I get more time in the sauna, which still decreases my inflammation and enhances a respiratory effect? Can I lean into my mindset? Can I observe other people training and add tools to my toolbox around transitions, different breathing patterns, maybe different movement strategies, you know, in, in some of the skills. And it, it, it is a really cool lens, you know, for, for those of us on the outside to realize, you know, the importance of all of the other things. We talk about watching film and basketball and football. And, you know, you, you really studied not just yourself, but others and the craft, all while a global pandemic was kind of, you know, looming over, over the heads of all of us. And we're all dealing with what I call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Yeah. And, you know, at that time, were you aware that you were gathering all these tools for your toolbox? And, you know, what were some of the, the cognizant decisions that you made in your daily routine? Um, so, no, I would say at the, at the beginning of it, I was not aware of it. And it wasn't until like, I think something cool happens when you need to figure something out, when there's like a desperation to it and there's no other option. And I think at the start, like you just end up being... It was a real awakening call for me when January 2020, I can't even like, I want to be an athlete and I can't even like bend over to pick up a pillow off the floor. You know, like I was trying to like, I remember just like, okay, what can I do? And I started, um, I was meditating. Um, I started doing yoga and I still wasn't even able to, I remember taking like yoga classes and I still wasn't able to do all of them. So I was like, I do, I do what I can. If I can't do that pose, like I can't, then I just stand on my mat while that's happening. Um, I started journaling. Um, so I think like at the root of that, I think I started just like meditating. I started like getting more grounded. I started just like, honestly, trying to get more in tune with like who I am at the core you know, not the athlete me, like not the daughter me, not the friend me, just like, who am I? And like, what am I feeling inside of me? Um, so I think that was the start of it. And then just being an athlete, I think I was very, um, I had a certain, 
I had a plan in mind. I'm a big planner. And when things don't go as I've planned them, I tend to like, that does rattle me. And I know that about myself. And I decided that, you know, by February, I was going to hopefully, like, I want to be starting training again. I want to be moving a barbell by this week. I want to be doing all these movements by this week. And I wanted to be competing. Um, I had plans to compete at the West Coast Classic. And I think it was March. Mm-hmm. And when these things weren't happening, according to plan, I was like, I'm going to be moving a barbell. I still wasn't moving. And I kept like pushing these things and I kept pushing my back when it wasn't ready to be pushed because I decided that I was going to compete in March. So again, like this is another thing that I feel like COVID was a complete blessing for me because I was pushing and pushing and pushing and I wasn't ready. And then West Coast ultimately got canceled um, because of COVID. (laughs) And that actually was just like, okay, I don't have to be ready for anything right now, but I do think I like gone I didn't treat the rehab like I should have um so I feel like that actually was like I went into another like really challenging phase where I'm like I really just want to be like training I really want to be getting back into shape and my back was just my body doesn't know what my mind had planned if that makes Mm -hmm. sense I wasn't listening to my body and taking it through like I think into like May and June that's when I started really like feeling the pressure of like I haven't been training like I need to be training like I need to be ready for the CrossFit Games like I am I I and only I will ever know if I'm ready for the CrossFit Games and I I felt those I know when I walk in when I'm ready and when I'm not and I wasn't ready and I started working with a sports psychologist. Her name is Tiffany Jones. She's incredible. And she helped me so much through these this phase where that's when I had to like really start taking a deep dive into like, what is my edge? Like, what do I have? Because I didn't have that edge of being able to train more, um, of being able to even being able to do all the physical things that like I wasn't able to clean heavy, uh, snatch heavy. And we were like, what can I do? And it was actually a legit conversation that we had in May of like, do I actually just take this year off? I'm like, do I just completely scrap it? I have a year and a half runway for the next year. Um, Or do we just lean really hard into everything that I can do? And I actually remember making the choice of like, we, uh, I was like, let's scratch this year. And it just felt so wrong to me. My gut immediately was like, no, 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 no. Like I can't. And the day after I was like, nope, we lean into what I can do. <clears throat> so we've really for, I started running a whole bunch more. I like leaned into fitness workouts. So again, like I can't be lifting right now. I don't have the barbells, but I can run. I can burpee. I can do pull-ups. I can do gymnastics. Like I could do all those things. So we just doubled down on those things. And that actually, that brought my spirit back because yeah. I, to like be I felt like I was getting better I was getting fitter I was getting like the things that I was good at I was just enhancing even more and I don't know if it was just the time or if it was actually like that the pressure off of it and that I was actually doing something that I felt like was productive that like helped heal my back but slowly but surely like I was starting to be able to lift again by like June and July and then because of COVID the games kept getting pushed back so I kept getting more and more time to be able to you bought try, your time, which actually really. And I felt like for before stage one of online qualifier, I was in an awesome place. I was really excited about what we were doing. And my one goal, literally what I wanted to do was to find my edge and push it. I was like, I was like, I have six shots here. I can't remember six or seven um, or how many tests there were. And I was like, as long as I know that I gave everything that I have and I was willing to go to like still that 1k row I was in a black hole for probably 750 of those meters oh my gosh I told myself that I was just gonna pull as hard as I could and I would never ever give up and that was the mindset part of it that I was gonna dig in and lean into everything that I had and I didn't have the physical but I have my mind and I I was reading I was journaling I was working with sports psychologists and that was the things that I was just going to completely lean everything that I had into 
And Kat, I, you're getting me fired up over here. <laughs> I, I love hearing this. You know, it sounds like, you know, your work with Tiffany Jones was was very magical. Where, yeah. where I'm incredibly curious is I've gone through injuries. I've, I've been around people that have gone through lots of injuries. Yeah. How did you maintain so much childlike optimism to believe that you were going to get to a point where you could compete the way you wanted to? Because I feel like there's that that moment in time where you're like, should I get an MRI? Should I go to the doctor? Yeah. Like, will I ever be able to do this again? And there's these ruminating thoughts, which, you know, they're not necessarily true, but I feel like inevitably everybody goes down that rabbit hole occasionally. Yeah. How did you keep the the thought process of like, there's, there's always light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah. So just to be completely honest, like it wasn't always there. Like I went through like that, 2020 was one of the most challenging years that I've been through. It was really tough. And I had my moments, like I said, where I was like, do I just not compete? Like, am I not going to be ready? And I actually was, I, I would love to go through my journal entries. And I was, I was the first year that I was actually practicing being honest with myself because very naturally, and I think this is just in my personality. I, which is, this is a, everything's a double-edged sword. I think this is my greatest quality. And I think it's also bit me in the butt so many times, but I always see the, I'm like, it's going to be a fine. It's going to be great. Like if my back's hurting, I'm like, that's okay. I can work on my gymnastics. Like I do have that like ingrained in me. And sometimes things need to be looked at and just like completely tackled and in an honest manner. Um, so that year was extremely tough for me, but I will say that like, I do have this insane belief. And sometimes I think it's like a little bit probably crazy. Um, but I'd much rather like be a little bit crazy and like fail than not have that belief. Like at least I want to believe that I can do something. And I never lost complete hope. And I think I always believed that I could do it. And I still to this day, like, I'll tell you, I think I can do anything in this world that I set my mind to as long as I'm willing to work for it. Like you might not be able to do everything and there's things that you might have to sacrifice, but I always like, there is, oh, I, there was this, this, okay, now I'm going all over the place, but there was this story. And this is like, I, this is one of my favorite, like fables. I can't remember where I heard it or read it. I think I heard it on the podcast, but there was this, this boy that was like, he was applying for colleges. He was not a good student. And he like, didn't apply for the colleges. Dad was like, did you apply? And he was like, nope, didn't apply. And he was like, why? Like, why not? And he was like, cause I'm not going to get in anywhere. And his dad was like, well, you didn't even apply. Like you won't know. So he was like, okay. So he like wrote a letter and he sent in that, um, sent in the application. And he was like, Ooh, like suddenly he felt that he was like, Ooh, like, what if I get in? Like he had that hope. And then he got the letter back where like with a, like from the school and he was like holding the letter and he was like, Oh my God, it's like, maybe like, maybe I did make it in. And then he opens the letter and like, of course he didn't get in. Like he didn't even apply in time, but it, that moment of hope that he had, that's something that like from that story is like, even if the, even if the chance is 1%, you're 99% likely not to, but 1% likely there's still a shot. Like, why wouldn't you take that shot? Like, if you don't take it, it's a hundred percent guaranteed you won't. So I love holding on to that one percent. Like, even if it's unlikely, like hold on to it because just maybe. I I am just jaw dropped at that story. I mean, I might even have to title your episode "Holding On to That One Percent." Um, it, the thing I love about that cat is that it, it, I categorize that as a beginner's mindset. Because, I mean, you know what it's like. You first get into CrossFit. You saw Annie. You're like, hey, I'm going to be on the podium one day. And then you get, like, the the communication from the, the seasoned veterans or the, the older athletes. And they're like, oh, right. You're going to make the CrossFit Games. You're brand new. You don't know anything about anything. But in here, you're envisioning it. You're seeing the plan. And, and I, I just love that about children, right? You look at children, and they're just like, I, one day they're an astronaut, the next day they're a professional athlete, the next day they're a lawyer, the next day they're a doctor. It's like, believe they can do it why, all. why not? Like, I, I feel like the societal norms condition us to become calloused and paralyze ourselves to, to live within this box. 
And that's, that's not a way to live. I think you got to live like pushing boundaries, asking the difficult questions and maintaining that, that Disney like magic dust to truly and authentically believe that, that all things are possible. And it's cool to hear that you were able to maintain that even during the lowest of the low where, you know, at that time your identity is, Hey, I'm a professional athlete and I can't perform the way I want to perform. I can't even put my socks and shoes on. And that that's going to be where I'd like to take the question or the conversation next. And that is this, this relationship with identity. You know, you, you became this CrossFit games champion and that's how everybody wanted to communicate with you, taking little consideration into the fact that you're actually Katrin David's daughter, the human first. And those are just things and places that you've traveled along the way. How have you been able to navigate that dance now that you've you know, gained all this wisdom and maturity across your journey so far where people want to talk to you because of these things that you've done? But in reality, as we talked a little bit about offline, th- those are just points in time. I really want to chat with you because of the character attributes that you've been so, so generous to share with me today. Thank you. Um, I think it's been both an extreme privilege because I do believe winning the CrossFit Games has changed my life and it has given me these insane platforms to share and inspire. And it's shown me what I'm capable of and I've gotten to go to events and um, there's an ESPN Women's Summit or ESPN Body Issue. And like, I've had a lot of things and I was like, holy smokes, that's so cool that I've gotten to do. Um, and it's also at the same time been extremely challenging. And especially like at the start of it, like there are a lot of things that um, being titled the fittest on earth, there's I or I felt this extreme pressure of a so as an athlete, your body ebbs and flows. And at the CrossFit Games, you're at the peak of your shape. Everything that you do all year for multiple years revolves around peaking in August every year, the end of July, beginning of August. And you show up at the games and the photos that are taken, the videos, you're pumped, you're sweaty, you're ripped, like all of these things. And that was something that I really struggled with was like, even just the image of like, what should the fittest on earth look like? Like, is it not okay for me to like gain a couple pounds in the off season, even if I'm trying to get strong or this or that? And um, how should the fittest on earth like act or show up or what a, at this competition? And there's these external pressures that I was just taking in and allowing to feel pressured by. And that's something that throughout the years, I've also had to start shedding and start um, thinking about what is actually true and what is actually perception and what might actually be true, but I shouldn't be taking in. Like that shouldn't be my concern. And at the end of the day, like being crown fist on earth, like again, like I don't get anything this year for being 2015 and 16 fittest on earth. Like you start at ground zero and I'm still just me and I still have to earn everything. And I think that's also been a healthy mindset to just like, you know, not think too highly of myself. I'm not the fittest on earth. I'm just catching and I'm me and I still do my dishes and I, I still, you know, like you end up, having a bad day or a good day and and you're just a a regular person that has to earn it like anybody else and I think that's been like a a healthy realization that kind of brings me back down and and kind of sheds the um sheds the pressure off of that a little bit Mm -hmm. I love that you said sheds uh one of my favorite statements that relates to what you're saying is from the rugby team in New Zealand, the New Zealand All Blacks, and they talk about sweep the sheds. Oh, where, yeah. you know, not, none of us are above, you know, putting our weights away or, you know, cleaning up some chalk or doing doing some of those extra things that maybe make somebody else's life a little bit easier. You know, I love using the reference around putting your shopping cart away. It's such yeah. a small, nuanced part of the day, but you know, despite the fact of our our accomplishments in life, you know, those are things that are part of our character and they're the little nuggets that, you know, helped shape who and why you've been able to accomplish these, these amazing things in your life. 
You know, I love that you described the the thought process around body image. I feel like that's that's something that's you know kind of looming and floating floating around within the labels of of the female athlete. You know, what advice would you give to some of the up and coming women that are navigating, "Hey, I want to perform, I want to feel good." You know, you I I want to strive to maintain a healthy and normal menstrual cycle and sleep cycle. You know, what what advice would you give women trying to pursue their peak expression, but then simultaneously have the confidence to eat quality food that's, you know, satisfying the nutrient requirements of the day without this societal pressure of, oh, I have to look this way to satisfy, you know, said people or whatever. Yeah. Um, And that's, this is something that I'm still to this day, just always working on. So I don't have the answers, but my own journey has been of really this year focusing on feeling for performance. So I've been through a lot. Like when I came into CrossFit, I knew nothing about um, fueling or nutrition. I honestly, coming from gymnastics, all I ever wanted to be was smaller and skinnier. And I was definitely afraid of carbs. Like, Like I wouldn't touch potatoes or bread or I started eating sweet potatoes a little bit, actually. I started eating those. But like, then learning that like, oh my God, like carbs are your friends. Like, no, you need the carbs. I remember start when I started at boot camp, um, one of the coach went over, like she was asking me what I would eat. And that was the first time that she was like, oh, like you're not eating any protein with like your lunch or whatever. And you're, you don't have carbs here. So that's when I started learning just like the balance of it all and that we need all of it. Um, and then I've been through a couple of years where I was severely under eating for what I was training. And yeah, I looked ripped and I might have looked like I was extremely fit. And I associated that with the leaner that I was, the fitter that I was. Mm-hmm. And then getting into the ha- harsh reality of like, okay, this isn't a bodybuilding competition. This isn't even a whatever we look like competition, this is actually like the sport of fitness. And this is a competition of who can go the fastest and move the most weight. Um, And kind of having to like, take away that association with like, and I think a lot of females in the sport do that with associating being lean with being fit. And now I'm honestly, it's um, just eating enough. And especially in the off season and Matt Fraser is actually like helped me so much with this because he was like, I wasn't the leanest. I was never the leanest, but I fueled myself and I always had fuel for my body and learning that. And one of the things that we're trying so hard to do right now is gain strength. And that's so hard in that when you're in a calorie deficit. So now being okay with like, okay, if I put on a couple pounds, hopefully it's like, I just need that to gain strength and knowing where I am with that. And that's okay. And even like a couple extra pounds in your body, it'll probably like, it might not even be detrimental to gymnastics because you might actually just be recovering better. You might be able to perform better. So finding that kind of balance of just like eating healthy foods, eating nutritious foods, just treating your body. Like I put so, I ask so much of my body I train hours and hours, five days a week. I did a bike workout this morning because it's like a recovery day and I take a full rest day. And just every day, like listening to my body, giving it what it needs. And I do believe that it will settle if you train really hard and you treat it really well, like it will settle into your optimal body, if that makes sense. No, I I think it's incredible the way you describe each of the different categories around like bodybuilding, physique, and then obviously training for performance. They are very different. And sometimes the the narrative that's that's shown within the fitness world is the pursuit of bulging muscles, six pack abs, tons of vascularity, um, which is fine if that is, if that is the goal. But that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that it's better than a competitive athlete that's seeking to move faster and lift more. It's just a different goal. And I think it's important to create that distinction around, you know, the, the best athletes in the world don't necessarily have to look a certain way. 
Yeah. And there's genetic factors. You know, there's so many different variables that come into play. This episode is brought to you by Mush. My friends over at Mush created an incredibly cool product of ready-to-eat overnight oats. And for those of you that listen to the podcast often, you know simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And Mush has done just that, as their products have no more than seven clean ingredients that are dairy-free, gluten-free, with no added sugar. Mush started right here at Invictus, as they had a vision to create convenient, healthy, and clean nutrition. And this landed them on Shark Tank, where the famous Mark Cuban invested in them. Now they're found in retailers all over the country, including Costco, Sprouts, Target, and Whole Foods. Check out my friends over at www.eatmush.com. But you know, I, th- I think at the end of the day, we're all seeking the, people call it balance, but I, I like to look at it like dosage. What is the right dosage for the individual which varies based on the element of the season. And then how does that also harmonize in your life? Because when we look at hormones and mindset, it's like if you're going to a special event and you're so focused on looking a certain way that you can't indulge on a special meal with other people, well, now like you have all these ruminating thoughts. Cortisol is probably through the roof. You're probably incredibly stressed, insecure. You're not actually enjoying the moment. Well, how good is that for the life experience? Yeah. And I'm not saying dive in and eat the whole cake and, you know, destroy yourself with sugars, but it's, 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 it's this ebb and flow of give and take and trying to find what, what works for you, the individual based on lifestyle. And so I yeah. think the way you described that was, was very, very cool and gives a lot of insight to people going yeah. through a similar journey. Thank you. I still feel like I'm rambling on the subject because I'm honestly, I'm, I'm learning all these things myself and I'm getting a better relationship with fueling my body for performance. And I think ultimately like the underlying thing that I, I continue to question is always, is this better for my performance? Cause that's my goal right now. And people can have different goals. And if they're not a performance athlete, um, you can eat less than if you want to be a performance athlete, Um, But ultimately, just fueling your body with what it needs and always asking yourself, is this going to lead to a better performance? You know, like, yeah, for sure. I love the the vulnerability when you say you're rambling on the subject, because I mean, that's that's the beauty of podcasting is it, it, it gets messy. Sometimes we don't always say the right thing. It's what's at the forefront of our brain at that moment. And I think it'll be really cool to watch the evolution of your podcast with Annie, where you guys converse and dissect, you know, complex topics like macros and nutrition and performance versus physique and, you know, integrate thoughts from, from Sammy and Matt up at HWPO and what their thoughts are. Side note, uh, the, the meal that she provided with, um, the the, the the fitness film festival. Oh (laughs) my gosh. That was absolutely incredible. Uh, huge shout out to Sammy as she is just something else when it comes to food and also her demeanor. She's so happy and so sweet. That was my first time meeting her and it was just such a, an incredible experience. So I've worked with Sammy um, when we were back, when we were both at Reebok. I worked with Sammy when she was working with O'Keefe. Um, mm-hmm. so I've, I've spent years. So I've got, I know every one of them like individually so well. And every time you take, or when we were somewhere, but when you're with Sammy and you bring her into a room, the rest of them like, oh, I love Sammy. I was like, I know I do too. She's just like this sunflower that she just has the greatest, like brightest um, demeanor about her. And I feel like she like leaves people happier than when she arrived. And I love that about her, but I am also very inspired by her cooking. And we were up in Vermont last week and I was telling her that like each night there was, it was so different in the way that she puts things together and individually oh, yeah. cooks things and what she puts on top. I was like taking notes. I'm like, Oh, I'm like, Sammy, I'm just so inspired by you. And I always, I was literally baking her banana bread before this. So good. So good. Her, her combinations, her presentation, she, she does such a great job, but I can't help you reference briefly that you know, she, she has this unique frequency. She, she leaves a room 
better than when you know she originally arrived and that that's an incredible gift and kat you've been very vocal about how your grandmother did the same thing Mm -hmm. how she did an incredible job really making people feel seen heard understood and loved will you chat briefly around your relationship with your grandmother and how important she is to you um so my mom was 15, almost 16 when she had me. So she still lived at home. Mm -hmm. Um, So from when I was, when my mom went back to school, my grandma would have me during the day. So I got to develop this, like I am extremely close with my grandparents, which I know is, is not such a given thing, even just like, they were still so young too. Um, And later in life, like when we lived in different countries, when they lived in Denmark or the States, like I'd spend my summers with them. Um, So I've just always been like very much like a, we call it a a man of his girl. Um, And there's something about like, I just think grandparents in general, they're not your parents and they don't have to raise you. And all they do is just love you. And that's all that I ever felt from her was just this extreme unconditional love. Um, And like I told you before, like I was never a good gymnast, but if they had the opportunity to come like watch me compete, she was the loudest in the stands. Like she, (laughs) everybody knew where my grandma was and she was, she'd like stand up and her hands were always in the air and she'd yell out loud. Um, No matter what I was doing, she was just always so proud. Um, so we had an extreme, we had a really good relationship and even like, she was just one of my friends. Like if I had a, a lunch break and I, instead of calling one of my friends, I might call her to go out, out for with lunch. And so just an extremely great friend, an incredible rock. And then her, just how she is, that stays with me forever and always as a guiding light of how I want to show up in this world. And she had the biggest, brightest laugh. And one of my favorite things, this is a great quality, um, is that she made people feel very seen. And I still like, um, whether it was meeting somebody in an elevator, whether it was the the person there at the grocery store helping you out, like she would always kind of like, I feel like give them that slight bit of like pause in the time of day of like, like, hello, like, I see you, um, ask them how their day was. And I feel like I could always feel like them get like, kind of like two inches taller Mm -hmm. and kind of like, just leave the energy in the room, just lighter and brighter. Um, so as unfair, and I'm, I know that you've felt the exact same things that it's, I believe everything in this world happens for a reason, but I'll never understand why we lose the people that we love. Mm -hmm. Um, But I still, I will always be thankful for having had that relationship and having had her so close to me in my life for 23 of those years. Um, And there are still some like, and again, like the universe just works in incredible ways, but she left these three little notes for me randomly. It's she never used to. And these were, one was written in, she passed away in April of 2016 and one was written in January. One was written on the um, 4th of April and one was on the 8th of April and she passed um, a week later. So I have these little notes that was like, one of them, I'd love to share this if you don't mind as a- Yeah, please do. Poem that she wrote and it was, it's in Icelandic, but the translation is think to the sky, keep your feet on the ground and your heart in the right place. And Mm. remember, light up the day with a rays of appreciation. And I feel like that just encompasses so much of like, think to the sky, that's the, hold on to the 1%, believe you can, like, that's just like, Mm -hmm. all right, go for whatever your dreams are and believe it, but keep your feet on the ground. It's stay humble, stay rooted, like know that you have to work for it and keep your heart in the right place and do the right thing, whether somebody's watching or not. And then the appreciation, that's what I feel like is just like, the greatest gift you can give anybody in life is just appreciate what's in front of you and see what's in front of you. So, um, yeah, that one, I, I recite almost every single day in my head. Wow. That that's absolutely incredibly beautiful. I might actually reach out to you to have you, uh, 
type that out. I might need to put something like that up on a wall of some sort. It, it, it really hit me in a special place. And at the film festival, you know, Todd Mullaney, the, the incredible CMO of, of Noble, he's just so resourceful. He, he always takes time out of his day to, to connect with people. Yeah. And, he, and he seeks out the best in the world. And he was able to find the famous poet in Q. So and I wasn't there, but I heard that your poem was incredibly magical, as was Sam Dancer's, and which he so eloquently read on the bus for all of us, which I, which I love. Huge shout out to my buddy, Sam. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I wanted to just kind of chat with you. You know, poetry is so beautiful. It's elegant. It, um, you know, I always say on this podcast that words are a, an approximation of what we're actually trying to convey, which is why music is so beautiful, because the melody sometimes just articulates our feelings a little bit better. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious, what was your experience going through a relatively vulnerable, vulnerable piece in a, in a public setting among your noble friends, family yeah. and community? Um, I know he loves starting it off where... You give massages to the person next to you, massages to the person, other person next to you. You're like, oh, this is kind of weird, but also kind of awesome at the same time. It and then you go into uh, the amazing poetry. What was that kind of like? Um, so I actually, I do journal. I'm not sure that I, I do have like a hard time sometimes articulating what I'm feeling and thinking and putting it into like concise words. So I was little excited about it and I was also really nervous about it and we had these 20 minutes to to write a poem about something that changed who you are as a person and I just started writing and then I'm kind of just keep writing and I'm just writing for the full 20 minutes and like and he where there's just a couple of us left I didn't even have time to like read over it and so when he then asks does somebody want to come up and share? I hadn't even read my poem. I'm like, I'm like, oh, don't ask me. Don't ask me. You know how like <laughs> just when you're speaking in front of people, it's like, you know, you're like, Whew. you just kind of get nervous for it. And like, what, what are people going to think? Is it, was my poem even good? Like I was thinking all of these things. And then um, Oakley, who I had never met her before. She's completely new to the Noble team. Don't think she knew hardly anybody in the room. She stood up and I was like, wow, he actually like uh, called her out and asked her to share her poem. And she was like, okay. And I was like, so impressed that she was so new. She knew nobody. Like most of us have been there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and she delivered this incredible poem. And it was really fun for me to get to hear hers. Cause like I'd spent my time writing mine and like hers was so different. And like, like we talked about right at the beginning is like, everybody has a story and like, what was hers? And I loved getting to hear hers and just feeling like I gotten to know her and gotten to know like a part of her that I otherwise never would have known. Um, and then Jared stands up and shares his, and again, just like completely different and so vulnerable and so open and such a cool experience. And I started to feel like I was like, ooh, like I don't even want to like take up their time. Like I want to hear as many of these poems as I can. Like I don't want to like take up any time. And, and there's a third one that shares. And then in Q actually at the end, he was like, well, he only had three people share. And he was like, the poem isn't complete until you've shared it with one person. And he was like, I won't ask you to do anything that you won't, but pick a partner and share. And I, I challenge you to share your poem with that partner. And I'm sitting at Suggested Madeira's, which again, I was talking to Daniel Robbins works with both of us. And I was just telling him how I felt like I had connected with Justin and like through this experience and um, just gotten to know a, a part of him that I didn't know. And so we sat down. It was just me and just everybody went into their own corner and I shared my poem with him. And I actually like loved sharing it with him. And it like it actually felt really good to read it to him and share it. And I was like, wow, like that I loved getting to do that. And like vice versa, like he got to share his with me. And and it was just a really cool experience. So when I sit down, I was like, I kind of I kind of did want to share mine like with the group. And 
I was like, but I kind of also didn't because I was nervous about it. But here's the, this is something that I'm working on. I don't like not doing things because I'm scared of it. And I really, I feel like there are so many like opportunities in life that you can miss. And these are brief moments. You can just like miss a moment to say something because you're like nervous about like, is it the right thing? Like, do you not? You can miss an, a big opportunity or a chance to do something because you're like, Ooh, what if this? And I, I actually, I really don't want to live my life like that. And I don't, I really, the idea of regret kind of terrifies me. I'm like, Ooh, I'm like, what are the things that I could be missing out on? I'd rather just take the risk and if something terrible happens. It just happens. Nothing terrible is going to come from reading a poem though. But <laughs> I was literally, so I'm sitting there and I like really don't want to read it, but I really do. And I was having this moment of like, this was one of those things that like, I did want to share it, but I was just kind of scared to. And if you don't want to do something, that's fine. But if you don't want to do it because you're scared to, that's a different thing. And then NQ stands up and he was like, it was finished. Like everybody sure there is. Everybody sat down and he was just like, all right, just before we wrap this up, he was like, I'm going to, I'm, I want to perform one more poem. And it started off with like, say yes. He was like, take like, take the chance and like feel the adrenaline. And I actually felt like he was speaking to me and I was like, <laughs> this is it. So actually like when Todd came up and he was wrapping it up, I actually like put my hand up and I was like, do you actually mind if I would share mine? And I was so nervous for this. And I was actually really proud of myself after for like, that was really scary and that was really uncomfortable, but I did stand up and I did share my poem and like, whether it's this instance or some other like that's just something that I'm practicing and I'm challenging myself with it's like do it even if it scares you mm -hmm. and like you never know what can come out of it and I I really did love getting to to share it there's so much to unpack from that I mean first and foremost you know Oakley having the bravery to share hers yeah you know it, it just goes to show that you never know who you're inspiring you know, so so when you're, you're performing a task or just going through your day to day or becoming a master of the mundane, you really never know who's watching. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece that I'm hearing is that just like what we're describing today, like vulnerability bleeds and breeds vulnerability from others. If I share a little bit, well, now you're going to share a little bit. You realize that it's a judgment free zone and yeah. that we're all striving to navigate the human experience and that we're we're spiritual beings that are having this human experience. And there's certain things that happen as humans that we can't necessarily see. And this is one of those things where there's a, there's a magical frequency where you were able to conquer, you know, this, this subtle fear that you were having a little bit of being scared of something. Maybe it's public speaking, maybe it's judgment, maybe it's feeling like you're oversharing. But then on the other side of that, I'm sure you got other people wondering. And I think, you know, typically, I think Stephen Pressfield talks about this in The War of Art. He goes, you know, resistance is, is always going to exist. But if you're afraid of it, it's probably the place you should probably go. And if you <laughs> yeah. relate that to the CrossFit experience, it's like, all right, if you don't want to hurt on burpees or devil press or you know, really high volume alternating dumbbell snatches. All right, we should probably go there a little bit more. Or if it's a strength piece, it's like, all right, where where do you struggle in the front squat? Yeah. Let's go visit that space. Let's program our Google Maps to get more comfortable in that spot. And that way we don't need Google Maps anymore. We can just navigate it right here. Yeah. Um, there, there's just so much to unpack from your storytelling. It just goes to show, like you said, the power of a moment. It's it's so incredibly special, Katra, and I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. That's just to like follow up on what you were saying too, of like, so one of the things that I'm really experiencing with starting a podcast and I was just telling Brooks about this. I was like, I was like, I'm really excited. And it really terrifies me. He's like, why? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just really uncomfortable with, with launching it. I was like, I'm, I, and I, I was actually like trying like real time processing. Like, what is it? Like, am I not going to be engaging enough? Am I sharing too much? Am I sharing too little? What do I say? What do you not? And there's this vulnerability about it. And then we were, I was thinking about that and I'm like, there's never, I don't think I've ever, ever encountered a possible, like an, um, a situation where somebody was vulnerable with me and I didn't like them for it. 
-hmm. You know, like, I think it's always like a connecting as long as it's truth, as long as it's true vulnerability, it's truth and it's honesty. Um, I do believe it connects us. And I believe that being vulnerable does, as you say, like breed like vulnerability back and it breeds this like safe space and a no judgment zone. And why are we so scared to share? Like, why are we so scared to like take our shells off and shed some layers and like show what's actually underneath? It's like, I think we're so scared of being our true selves and being judged for it. And like that not being good enough or that not being great enough or not being funny enough or engaging enough. And like, but at the end of the day, we just are who we are. And if people don't like it, like, that's okay too. Like, totally. I think it's cool too because, I mean, I've, I've experienced this in the podcast space. Like, I feel like I've gotten an MBA talking to people way smarter than me. And it, it's so cool because in the pursuit of striving to get to know others, I've actually built a better relationship with self. Hmm. I've gotten to know me better. I've under I've I've learned to understand like, oh, why why do I say that a lot? Why do I lean into this element of their story versus this element of their story? And you get to know your biases. You get to know cognizantly why you you lean into certain verbiage. And and then you're like, okay, I I like this about what I'm doing. I don't like this. And then you can learn to deconstruct it. And then you self-reflect like, where did that come from? Where did I hear that? How did that become a part of how I digest and communicate with others? And I don't know. I just feel like it's a constant upgrading of the operating system in between the ears. And so it's very similar to the physical of training. And now I just view it now as like a version of mental fitness. Mm. That's a very good point. And honestly, it's made me so much more excited about having yeah. a body. What am I going to find out? Yeah, That's you're going you're gonna to learn a ton. And honestly, like I'm a huge believer that that all tides rise. So please reach out, as I mentioned a little bit offline. Like I've made every mistake in the book, used the wrong mics, had the wrong software. In the beginning, I was afraid to ask for help and was, you know, in my life, you know, since you shared a little bit of your own personal vulnerability, for me, it was always like self-reliance is everything. If I outwork the competition and put in more hours, like I'm going to win. Yeah. And that worked for a really long time. So then the stubborn mind sets in. It's like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why should I change that? That got me to do all these awesome things in my life. And then it was like, oh, I'm punched in the face with a version of grief. Okay, now I'm navigating work stress. Oh, wow, I've accumulated this injury and that injury. And I just doubled down on, on the habits that I had up until then. Work harder, work through it, push through it. You'll be fine. Your body will respond. And that hole just got deeper and deeper until it got to the point where I was like, hey, I need to ask for help. What I'm doing isn't working anymore. The guy that went from A to B really successfully is struggling to go from B to C. And I could very easily lean into just being stuck in that fishbowl or it's like, all right, Let's self-reflect. Let's take a look in the mirror and let's try to deconstruct some of these habits because we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. So it's like, okay, let's upgrade these systems so that way we can navigate and utilize the transferable skills from a previous chapter in this next chapter. And, you know, I'm willing to share that with anybody that will listen because I think stagnation in life is probably the worst place we can all be. And we're all striving to, to evolve in some capacity. And I think just like you described with you and Annie pushing each other and challenging one another, like I believe the same thing in podcasting. I believe the same thing in, in any element of relationships. And I think it's very cool to, to relate that to kind of what you're doing now. And Katrin, I can't help like you had this awesome experience at – you know, CrossFit New England, New England for over eight years. You connected with Ben Bergeron and Heather Bergeron. You learned so much with so many training partners. And ironically, Matt Frazier was one of your training partners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How has it been navigating that relationship now where he was a training partner to now yeah. your coach? Because he knows yeah. you pretty well. Um, That was honestly like twofold. It was kind of like estranged in, a, in, a, in the sense of like, yeah, we used to, we were like siblings, you know, and just like training partners. And now he's my coach. So like shifting for both of us to kind of shift that, like 
what do you call it? Just like perspective and um, just roles. Um, but it was also so incredibly natural. And so like, I felt like I was just, it was so familiar, everything that we're doing. Like I told you, like um, we were training partners from 2014. We started doing training camps together. Um, Matt O'Keefe has been my agent since 2015, known him also since 2014. Um, Great guy. We've had him on the show twice. Awesome. Awesome. So um, and then Sammy uh, knew her before I even knew Matt. Um, worked with her at Reebok, then worked with her through um, O'Keefe. And then after we weren't training partners anymore, they just continued to be great friends. Um, and I would go up to, I went up to Cookville to visit them. Um, they came here last year just to like hang out and just, we keep developing just this greater relationship, which has also been so fun because you think you know somebody and then it's just so fun to continue to get to know somebody at a deeper level. Like I've always admired him and so inspired by him. And then now not being an athlete and running HWPO and being in such a different role than he was in, but he still has insane worth ethic. He's so intelligent. Just getting to dive deeper into his mind, I'm like, holy smokes, there's a reason that you are who you are. And that's so cool to just like continue to find those things out and be even more like impressed and inspired. And um, so it's been a really fun transition and also a very um, familiar one with just like that team is just people that I've known for going on nine years now mm -hmm. um, and he's just always been so willing to help and so straightforward he's always given it to me straight which i really appreciate direct honesty yeah direct honesty is huge and that that's the only way to really get to that next level if somebody's yeah. sugar sugarcoating something that's time you know that. a little bit tough and that's yeah. kind of what I wanted was a little curious about too is like the <laughs> crossfit media you know scheme or whatever loves to romanticize like, oh, these people are leaving comp train, da, 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 da. But like Ben's got some really cool philosophies. He did a really good job fostering, nurturing an environment, helping you grow from, as you described, a kid or a girl into a woman. Yeah. You know, what was, what, what's been the process moving away from something that was so comfortable for so long? Was there a little bit of a grieving process? Um, had you gotten to the point where you're like, Ben, I love you. You'll always be a part of my story, but you know, it's time for me to take, take my, myself to another spot. Yeah. I think as a, a human and a person, it was the, the hardest decision I've ever had to make hands down. I, um, that was really, really hard for me. It was not, um, I was not in like a great place making that decision, but athletically it was the right decision for me. Um, and I've had a lot of changes now in the past couple of years and it's been scary. It's, I felt insecure and, in, and in what I'm doing and I'm always just trying to do my best and hope that I'm making the best decisions. And like, you know, I look back and it's like, maybe I, I, not everything is always the right thing, but at least you're always trying to do, the best with what you have in that moment and making the decision to leave. Like, yeah, the Bergeons will always be my family. You know, I, I love them to death. Um, so that has been hard that like personally, yeah. And I know that they will always be in my life, but athletically, I do believe it was the right thing for me just to, it's a very natural thing in an athlete's life to make us. And that was something that I had to learn. Like it was so hard for me to make this decision, but honestly, people make coaching changes. And I learned so much from him. Like I had so much of my, my grit and my fortitude and my mental toughness and how I competed my fitness. I think my love for training, I think so much of it came through that. Um, but like anybody else, you have strength and you have weaknesses. And I think it was hard for me to develop. I was showing up again and again with the same weaknesses. And I wanted to explore elsewhere. Of how can I actually fill the holes for my legless, my muscle ups, my strength, um, just my raw, like power strength. So that's the extent of why I was 
I made that decision. And athletically, that was exciting for me to see if I would do something different, how that would work for me. And I worked with Yami for a year, another incredible coach, um, been Annie's coach from the complete start of her career, BK's coach for probably going on eight or nine years now. He's but been so freaking consistent. Bjork, Bjork Carl Gummins, and he's always been in the conversation. Yes, he's he never, he doesn't go wrong. He's always right there. Um, so I'm excited to see what, what he'll be capable of doing too. I always am. Um, so I was excited for that transition and he's so detail oriented and so technical. Um, but that was another one of those. And he's another incredible athlete and Annie and BK's work speak for themselves. They always show up in great shape. They, they don't go wrong, but that's just not to say that wasn't the right fit for me. And that has just because it was the right thing for me to keep moving on that honestly, it doesn't shed any bad light on neither Ben or Yami. Those are just decisions that I am making in my athletic career and I can't stay in a certain place for somebody else. I have to be making the right decisions for me as an athlete. Um, and after this year's games, again, like we haven't even like talked about that at all, but again, I'm in another position of not having made the games when I really tried. And, and I think there's the same as in 2014, there's something really powerful about that of like, it brings me right back to ground zero and I have nothing to lose. And there's something so powerful about being in that position because I, I can give everything that I got and I got nothing to lose. So I love, I, that. I love the place that I'm in right now. And it's been a couple of years of like so much change and so much uncertainty and so much doubt in myself and, and what I'm doing and just trying to like navigate through that. And right now with joining HWPO and um, having Matt as my coach, like Matt didn't get it wrong. We trained so well together. Um, I believe we work in very similar ways and, and I, I have so much confidence and confidence in what he's doing. He knows me so well. He knows so well how I operate and I have so much trust in what we're doing and I'm doing so much, but it's so awesome. Like I just have this, I love what I'm doing right now. And, and that's a, I, I will never take that. For, I have enough discipline to always do what's expected of me. But there's a difference between having to use your diff, like discipline and being in this place where I'm just, I'm so excited to go do what I'm supposed to do today. And I'm so, mm -hmm. I, I feel myself improving for the first time in, in many years. And that just ignites a fire that like, it brings me back to my second session, back tomorrow. It, it drips in a little bit more. And, and I just feel like I have, I still have so much left in me. I still feel like I have improvements potential left on the table that I still haven't improved. And that's something that excites me just to continue filling. And, and we have an incredible team. We have Rob's doing my um, strength programming. Amy's doing my OE lifting. Matt does kind of the overall thing. And it's just, it's a strong team of people and um, getting to work out with Mal. That's just like, she is, has so much fire. She goes so hard and she raises, she brings, she raises the standard every time, you know, we mm -hmm. were doing these, these bike intervals and I'm really strong on an echo bike. Like I would say I'm good on an echo bike and we were going like back and forth. And so I, I mean, I had a certain like, um, Watts in mind that I was going to hold and she's like, I go first for you. And I'm like, you can go first. And she gets on and she just hammers the bike and i mean i thought i was going to do it in like 40 seconds she gets off in 24 and i remember just being like okay and like i'm not like i'm gonna go do it in 24 now i'm not gonna let her beat me so i go on and hammer the bike but it's just those things of like i would have done a good job on that workout but she went out and she set a new standard she's like this is what we're doing and i have to match that it was such it was the first time that we trained together and it was such a cool experience to like okay like I'll meet you. It right alters there. your shape of perception because yes. of, of the unique art of comparison and comparison can be the devil, but it, it can also be an amazing gift. Double and it sure. sounds to me that the recipe and, and the village that you're able to connect with now in, in your unique cohort is, is exactly what you need. 
And sometimes it's challenging in transition to you know, live your life satisfying other people's expectations or the business logistics that come with it or realizing that you're leaning into your empathy in order to, in order to sacrifice your self res- self-respect. And, and that's tough sometimes because it's integration with people that you truly love and care about. But at the end of the day, this is your journey and you have to make the, the best decisions for you and those that truly love you will understand and realize that, you know, we all have our biases, but, you know, I, I love think of, thinking of it this way where, you know, the meat and potatoes of what you write down the center of the page is your journey. And some people integrate within that where they're a sentence or a chapter, or some people are simply just a little note in the margins. But at the end of the day, it's, it's you. You look yourself in the mirror every day when you're brushing your teeth or washing your face and you spend more time with you than anybody else ever will. If you're living your life to the beat of somebody else's drum, that's not fair to you or to them. And so ultimately, like, you know, I I honor your decision. I honor any athlete's decision to do what's right for them or what they believe is right for them in that moment, even if it's wrong. Yes. Because all of us are simply trying to do our best. And I can't help but note that one of our sponsors of the show and one of my really good friends is the founder of Trident Coffee. And how he founded that coffee company is he was stationed in Afghanistan, or it may have been Iraq, one of the two. And he was struggling to connect with the people within his environment. But he found that when they sat down and had a cup of coffee, he'd be, you know, across from a soldier that was an Afghani or an Iraqi soldier. And the conversation was like, hey, what are you trying to do? And he was like, well... I'm just trying to protect my family so I can go back home to my family. And then they asked him the same question. He's like, well, I'm trying to do the same thing. And it's like they're on different sides of the street, but they're trying to do the same thing. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, if we have that, that safe space in the middle, which is kind of navigating the messy middle, the gray area, it's not black, it's not white, but it's this unique understanding of seeking to understand that all of us are simply just trying to do our best. And it really helps to try and like, if somebody disappoints you, if somebody makes a decision that you wouldn't have made to actually just try and like see it from their perspective and have the belief that everybody is doing their best with what they have. Uh I truly believe that. And it was such a, I, I love what you said about the, the opponents on different sides of the street. They're both doing the same thing and they wholeheartedly believe that they're doing the right thing, but, I, but they're doing opposite things. And I think that just applies to so many things in the world that like, it's such a paradox. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's doing what they believe is the right thing, even though they have a completely 180 flip side decision or point of view than you have. And be it's, it's, just, it's, sh- it's shaped by so many different factors, upbringing, you know, experiences, traumas, and, and everything in between. And where I'd love to wrap up our conversation today is, you know, for a very long time, especially starting there in 2014, you operated at the beat of your own drum. It was, it was Katrin versus the world. It was, I never want to feel that experience again. I'm going to go over, under, around, or through if I really have to, to end up the fittest woman on earth. And so a very long time, it was a solo journey. You've referenced a little bit, you know, your observation of how Matt Frazier and Sammy have been able to complement one another. And you've recently embarked on a relationship with, with Brooks. And I got to meet him briefly at the film festival. Um, for those of you listening and not watching, it's amazing to see Katrin's ear to ear smile right now. And um, yeah, how's, how's it been having Brooks a part of the journey? And you know, how did you guys ultimately meet? It's been the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. Brooks is the greatest human I've met. I say this, he's my favorite energy on this planet. Um, and we've known of each other since 2015, 16. Like he was doing CrossFit with hockey and I was a CrossFitter and um, he loves the sport, just absolutely adores the sport and and just admires um the capabilities and it's so different from um hockey that he was playing um so he's actually he trains with me every single day 
Um, he has the strongest mind that I know about. So he gets me, you know, and I'm not, in the, if I get pouty, he's like, no, this is where we push back. So he's enhanced every single one of my experiences. And, um, and I think the bottom line, and we talk about this a lot of like, I think for so long, you feel like you're a little bit on an island, you know, like what we do is it's extremely hard and you have a certain lifestyle as an athlete and certain bedtimes and the life that I want to live and the choices that I want to make. Like you say, like you're the sum of the the closest people around you. And if they want to stay up late, you kind of get pulled up into staying up late. And if they want to eat like these kinds of things, you kind of just like end up at those restaurants too. And um, if they want to do this instead of working out, you kind of like, maybe you'll skip your second session, but like, he has enhanced everything that, you know, all values to me, the the way that I love to live or, and we love to live. And we very much said that, like, it's sometimes like kind of like kind of freaky how similar we are and how much of the same person, but been living on opposite like tracks we are. So it's been, it's, yeah, the first time that I've experienced it of like, meeting somebody who completely understands and gets it and not only understand and gets it, but um, he's so incredibly supportive with what I'm doing is that he always wants to find a way to make it better or make it easier on me or be able to get as much as I can out of it while I can, because mm -hmm. he's on the opposite side of it where he has retired and he loved hockey more than any, like since he was just, he was on skates by the time that he was two, he loved a game. He poured his heart and soul into it. He was very much like, he is the hardest worker that I know. And still to this day, if it's the yard, if it's his business, if it's um, CrossFit, whatever it is, he's the hardest worker that he's always working on something. Um, and I wish that I could have seen him play and seen him apply that to hockey. Um, but he loved it so much and um, retired in 2017. So he understands that there comes an end to it. And he loves life after hockey, but he always tells me to not rush to get there. Like that will be there and get everything that I can out of this experience while I can. Um, and I still love doing this so much. So it's, it's really a precious thing and to get to share this life with somebody else. So I, I do believe that I naturally, I, I do love my life and I've always, I love what I get to do. Um, and I do try and bring that gratitude to anything I've always done by getting to do things with him and going through things with him and sharing this life with him just enhances all of the experiences. So it's I love to hear it, and I'm so happy for you guys. I, w I was fortunate to be able to strut next to him a little bit yeah. uh, as we did our little yes, boy's swagger it. walk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he he needs to be an honorary member of uh, Team Too Tall over here, us, us CrossFitians that are over six feet. He gets I to actually, be an honorary part of that. You said that at the start of the podcast. You're like, I'm actually too tall. I'm like, oh, Brooks is in the same boat. You guys are CrossFit solo. Yeah, we'll hang out together. No. We can move the worm together yeah. in our uh, retired yeah. lane next to all you fancy <laughs> fitnessers. <laughs> uh, lastly, Katrin, you and Annie just came out with a children's book. Super yeah. cool. Uh, yeah. I believe it's titled, What is the Way? How did that come about? And man, it's so cool that you guys are inspiring the next generation. Oh my God. This was like outside of our career. It's the, the funnest project that, that I've done. And this was so, so again, this brings us back to me and Annie having ideas all over the place and we want to do so many things but it's really hard for us to like tie it into like a nice package, a bow and deliver it as we like it. <laughs> and when I wrote my book, Daughter, um, I wrote it with Rory McKernan and we were having a hard time like tying that together too. Um, so Christine came in and like helped us do that. Um, and 
Christine has for a long time, like when we're writing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, like we wanted to write like a slut dog book, have like little characters in that. Um, I've always wanted to write a children's book. Like I think children are just much more capable than and can understand and process so much more than we, what we give them credit for. Yeah, and like totally. life lessons and things that I've learned through CrossFit. Um, I would love to start sharing that and share that earlier. Like why make all these mistakes and if we can just teach them and put them into little lessons and have a character go through them. So I've had that in the back of my head of like writing a book for a long time, like a children's book. And then we got approached by Lumili me and Annie about writing a children's book. And we got so excited and, and she's also always wanted to write a children's book. So we were kind of just like, we were really excited about it. And we had all of these ideas and we were starting to like create the characters. And I think we had all of the, the red line through the book. We had the lessons that we wanted to put in. Um, we were having a really hard time like tying it all together and like putting it into a book until we brought Christine into the process. And then like, it was like magic started happening. We started writing this book and the, and the characters came to life and the lessons were coming to life. And it was, it was literally like after the book was unwritten, we then were part of the illustration process um, of like picking, we, we got samples from like different ones that we liked. And then we started creating um, each character. And like both of us are so, we're very like, like particular is probably the, the right word to put it. Mm -hmm. um, but just like, we know, we're like, no, like we need a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. Like the story is this, this. And we got to be so involved in everything in the process so that when we finally got the book, it's like both of us are so proud. I like the first people that actually read it to out loud, it was my, my grand, it was when Burks was in Iceland. My grandpa was over for dinner and we, we got the copy and I like wanted to read it out loud for them. And I, I got so much pride. I was so proud of reading it. I was like, this is such a good story. I'm like so biased saying that about my own book, but I love <laughs> it. It's so fun to deliver something to the world that you're so proud of. Like, mm -hmm. I was just like, I'm excited for everybody to get to read this book. And when people are like, oh, I got that for my kid. I'm like, oh my God, like, how did you like it? How do they like it? Like, I get really excited about it. And doing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, we have to write so many more books. Like doing this one, we already have like sequels. We want to do this one, that one. So yeah, it's it doesn't always happen that um, sometimes you take on projects and you do projects and sometimes you take them on and, and they light your world on fire. And this was one of them. So yeah. Um, yeah, we're really proud of that book. I'm so excited to check it out. I appreciate you sharing. And Catherine, it was such an honor connecting with you today and storytelling and, you know, getting a, a gentle behind the scenes look at all the amazing things that you've been able to accomplish across your career so far. I'm so happy we crossed paths at the I Noble guess. Film Festival yeah. and we're able to kind of make this happen. What's next for Katrin David's daughter? Um, honestly, just training. Like I, we had some travels, <laughs> um, back in Idaho. Now we're going to be traveling for Christmas. Um, we're going to do Christmas with his family in Arizona, Iceland and new year. And my whole family's coming oh, it's cool. my favorite thing to get to host new year. So those are really the only travels that I have coming up. And besides that, it's just, Lock down and and continue to train and this is the first time ever that I decided not to be competing like I didn't do it was, I love competing so it's such a hard decision to like not compete at Rogue and not compete at Waterpalooza and not com like I'm only I'll do the season um but it's the first time that I've truly given myself a runway to just train and focus on only on training so I'm really excited to see what I can do with that and I'm just loving like I honestly, this is pretty much my life in general. Like I've always been this way, but like, I love when I'm, I'm not concerned about what day it is. I'm not excited for Saturday or Monday or whatever it is. Like, it's just Thursday and I love it. And I'm excited for tomorrow and I'm excited for like, we love our, we, me and Brooks keep saying it. Like we just love our days and they're just normal days. They're just wake up and breakfast and we go train and we have lunch and then he goes to work and I train again and just, my normal days, I'm just loving. So staying in routine and training hard and um, seeing what seeing what we can do. Being where your feet are, 100% present 
there you have it, guys. The amazing story of Katrin's, Katrin David's daughter and everything in between. Thank you so much. It was so cool to connect. I'm really excited to see how your guys' podcast evolves and to see how you continue to train as a part of Matt Frazier and the HWPO crew. Please do not hesitate to reach out if there's anything I can do to help support yeah. you guys. Yeah. And for those of you listening on Spotify or Apple or observing on YouTube, if you enjoyed my conversation with Katrin today, please rate, review, subscribe, and share with your friends. And as always, stay on the hunt for who you've not yet become. Till next time, guys. Are you over 35 and in need of a solid training program? Are you looking to improve your athleticism and keep up with the younger athletes in your CrossFit gym? Then look no further than our Invictus Masters program. This program places year-round emphasis on mobility and stability exercises with movements that we have seen directly benefit our Masters athletes. Our program is led by Nicole DeHart and offers a training program designed specifically for Masters athletes who are looking to compete at a higher level in the sport of CrossFit. Some of our top Masters athletes in the world train with us, including CrossFit Games champion Kevin Kester, Matt Beals, and Pat Sprague. You can learn more about their stories and the Invictus Masters program by checking out their episodes right here on the Invictus Mindset Podcast. If you'd like more information about the current training cycle or to join the Invictus Masters program, please email Nicole at InvictusAthlete.com. That's N-I-C-H-O-L-E at InvictusAthlete.com.